Top of my head, I would say Andras in Les Mis. Oh, nice. um, that man knew how to dress, and, <laughs> and he rocks a waistcoat. Um, and pioneer of a shirt with roll up sleeves. So, yeah, I remember that one being my favourite. Music fades out. Hello and welcome to the Young Performers Podcast. Uh, this week uh, we've just had a few actors and we've had a musician by this point. So we're now going to interview our first student um, who is currently uh, going from second year into third year uh, at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. It's the wonderful, exceptionally talented Oscar Garland. Oscar. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Not at all. Um, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, so, uh, we're just going to jump straight in and yeah. go from the very beginning. Uh, so, uh, we're getting lots of uh, first-hand experiences of how people first got into acting. So, how did it all start for you? What was the very first thing you did? <clears throat> oh, God. Um, I, played, I played King Herod in my school nativity play. Wonderful. Uh, who, in my humble opinion, is still the ultimate baddie. Um, I think I must have been about four or five when I did that. Okay. Um, and that, that's my earliest memory of acting. I think that's the first thing I did. And then I did a couple of things on and off kind of going through school. I, I kind of fell in and out of love with it a lot as I was growing up. I was just developing other interests and I wasn't as passionate for it as I was now. Kind of, I'd, I'd do a play, I'd love it and I'd have a great time, but it never kind of hit me. Mm. that, that uh, I wanted to continue doing it. I just saw it more of a fun pastime. And then kind of it got to about 15. I just started a new school in London. And then uh, the drama department in this school was was amazing, uh, as was the, the head of drama there, Simon Parker, he was called. Um, and I just started doing more plays. And then they started introducing musicals into the school. And then uh, I, got, I, got, I was in my, my final year and I got an email from my music teacher at the time who, uh, it, it was an email from this amateur youth company who were advertising that they were doing a, uh, a show of Les Mis. And this was, this was back in 2012, so this is just when the movie had come out. So everybody, so that, that everybody was kind of on that hype train for that. And then uh, I auditioned, uh, got in, and then kind of immediately decided, all right, this is what I want to do. Was that the first time when you started thinking, I could do this for a living? Yeah. Or was it before that? Or? No, no, no. It was, it, it was then. It was uh, kind of, I, cause it was, I was rehearsing in an environment outside of school. So it was, my, it was my first kind of out of school acting project that I'd worked on and, uh, just getting to know the people and the director and, uh, we didn't really have a choreographer, but like movement, a movement coach and then a uh, musical director. I don't know. The, the, just everything kind of came together very nicely. And I, it kind of hit me like a train. I, I was realizing how much fun I was having. Um, and yeah, I don't know. The best way I can describe it is it's just like a little light bulb moment, you know? Yeah. And, I, and I kind of thought, okay, I really want to do this. Like there's, there's nothing else that I could be doing at this point. So you did Lamus when you were 18. Mm -hmm. So did you then audition for drama schools the following year or that year or? Yeah, it was, it was the following year. So I've had one year out since I left school mm -hmm. and, um, everything kind of happened at, at once in that year. I fell in love with acting, uh, with singing, and then realized, okay, I want to get a little bit better at this. So uh, that following year, I did the rounds and started auditioning. So which drama schools did you go for? I went for Rada Lambda Guildhall Central. Awesome, so you were looking at more of a straight acting training than a musical theater one at the time. Yeah, because I, mean, I mean, I loved musical, I, I do love musical theater, it's a huge passion of mine, but I never, I never considered myself to be that, th that good of a singer. And all of the people who were kind of uh, training at places like Arts Head on Mount View, I mean, they've been at it for ages. And because I started so late, my voice wasn't as developed as, as what theirs were. So I, I kind of thought, um, do a straight acting course, get singing lessons on the side as well, and then see where that takes. But I mean, the way it worked out, didn't get into RADA uh, or Guildhall. Um, I was kind of, I was halfway through my audition process for Lambda, uh, but then I got offered a place for, for the course more now, the musical theatre one at Central. And then, um, I don't know, I just, I kind of instinctually, I just jumped for it and I accepted. Awesome. 
Sweet. So can you tell us what it was specifically? Was there um, kind of anything about Central in particular that made you, was that I need to go there? Um, was there anything particular about the audition itself that made you kind of fall in love with it? Or? I don't, it's a, it's funny because I mean, I've only done one round of auditions, so I was still massively inexperienced with the practice of auditioning anyway. And so I, I remember the auditions being like nerve wracking as they usually are. And um, everyone, everyone in the building just seemed really, really friendly. And they, they seemed to have taken an interest in what I was doing. Um, and kind of each recall was, was a push forward. Mm -hmm. um, and I liked that. I think I just, I got on well with the, with the people and the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just very friendly. And it felt right. It, it felt right. Yeah. Did you have a really bad audition experience then? God, yeah. Guildhall was horrible. Oh, God. tell us about it. Guildhall was absolutely <laughs> horrible. I, um, well, first of all, they, they made us wait for kind of hours. I think they were running late. You don't um, audition in front of any of the faculty in, in, until your final one, final recall, I think. So for the first, I mean, I didn't make it past the first round. So I had two alumni who, from what I could tell, I can't remember their names, from what I can tell, they were either really hungover or just bitter that they had to come back and audition um, prospective students. But I, I don't know. They just they weren't very warm. They weren't very welcoming. They were mm. more strict than I felt they maybe had to be. And I mean, this was my second audition, so I, I still pretty much had no idea what I was doing. So kind of I had, um, they they reworked. I did. Um, Tis Torture, Not Mercy, Romeo and Juliet for them as my Shakespeare. And that was fine. And then they reworked it and they, they made me kind of sit down on the floor and just not move at all while doing the speech. And I didn't know what the hell they wanted. So I, was, so I can't imagine that went well. And then I did my, my contemporary to them and uh, you, you get to act opposite one of their third year students during the first round. And halfway through my monologue, he just like up and left the room. And, and this was before I realised that as an actor, you are allowed to move on stage. So, so I, didn't make, I didn't make any attempt to stop him um, or anything like that. He just walked and my monologue kind of fizzled out and, and died. Then it was, okay, thank you very much. And I left the room, went back to the waiting area. Not hopeful. Okay, so tell us about your best audition. Lambda was my best audition. Fantastic. Um... Again, much like Central Lambda, everyone was very warm and welcoming, and I just mm -hmm. I instantly had a really good vibe from that place. Um, I just, it was very, because at, at, at Lambda, when you audition for your first round, it's just you and the panel, whereas at Central, you are with all of the other, you know, prospective students mm -hmm. auditioning on that day. And I think I got on a lot better with just the uh, intimate audition mm -hmm. with just the panel. And I just remember going in and doing, I did my modern first and um, they seemed happy with it. And then I did uh, my Shakespeare, I did one of Iago's from Othello. And I just remember feeling really good about it. I, you know, I felt, I felt very confident walking out of that room and the, the interview with the panel was really lovely and they seemed to really like what I was doing as well. I think, if I think back to all my auditions, I would say in terms of what I felt, that one went the best. Cool. And do you have any advice for any student, for people who might be auditioning for drama schools right now? Anything that you wish that you had done or you hadn't done in hindsight that you can advise anyone on? There's a few things. I mean, it's very difficult to tell somebody not to be nervous and for them to actually mm -hmm. take that advice because nerves are natural and, and it's hard. But um, I, rem I was always really afraid of just failure and not being enough. So, I mean, what I'd say to somebody else, and it's a good piece of advice that I get a lot, even at Central now, is that the, the panel want you to do well. You know, they, they don't want you to walk in there being all nervous because that's gonna make them really nervous. It does, you know, if you, like if you go and see a professional show and God forbid one of the actors walks on stage and you can see that he's fluffing his lines or he's, he's looking really nervous, you feel really worried because you have no idea what he's gonna do. But if you walk in there just, as relaxed as you can be on that day and just be willing to share what you've prepared with them and think of it more as a collaboration rather than a, a kind of audition. I know that sounds a bit weird, but that's the best way I can explain it. Then you, 
chances are it's going to go a lot better for you. Mm. So, I mean, it's, it's really about what you can offer them rather than, oh my God, do they want me or don't they? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you said you did Iago for Mathello mm. as your audition piece. Um, how did you go about picking audition pieces for drama school? And in hindsight, now that you've had some training uh, for two years, uh, would you have picked different pieces? Like, what advice would you give in terms of finding monologues for drama school? Okay, the, the first thing I did was um, I looked on Central's website because Central have a um, select list of, of speeches that they ask their students mm. to use for auditions. So I picked them first, and they they were all kind of age appropriate almost like you'd have Romeo's and Hamlet's on there. Uh, so I picked those two and I think, uh, it was Tis Torture, Not Mercy from Romeo and Juliet. And then I don't remember if I had a, if I had a, no, 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 sorry. They only asked for one. So I only, I only did that one. And then for the other drama schools, I didn't want to use the same one because I was sucked into the whole rumor of don't use the same, yeah. speeches that other drama schools have got on a list because they'll know and they won't appreciate that they'll think you're lazy so then I I'd studied Othello in school and I'd seen the National Theatre production with Rory Kinnear and Adrian Lester brilliant and uh, I just remember really falling in love with the character of Iago but he I loved I loved his speeches I thought they were so cool because everybody wants to play a baddie yeah you know everyone <laughs> wants to play that dark <laughs> twisted villain and I honestly, I just I wanted to try my shot at that. So yeah. I, I I picked an Iago speech which I felt I I could do well and just made it kind of applicable to me and changed the circumstances a bit in my head so that it worked. Um, in terms of uh, for other people finding a monologue, uh, number one, don't listen to all of the rumors that oh it's so overdone, don't do it. Mm. It doesn't matter if something is overdone at all. Because everybody is going to do it differently. So all you have to worry about, if you do choose a very popular speech, is just do it truthfully and, and, and do it as you. You know, Don't have any pretense over it. Um, and in terms of finding one, I mean, sifting through a library of plays for hours on end is never fun. Sometimes it's necessary. But I mean, figure out your casting first and foremost. Um, find a speech that you you know that you like and then start looking at that playwright and see what else that playwright's written um yeah i mean it, finding a monologue is never easy it's not because it does you know sometimes you get lucky and you stumble upon like a, a gold mine of them but but more often than not you have to spend hours searching but um make it make it truthful and you know you don't you don't always need to keep it within the context of the play uh, the, be the best monologues that I've always found completely work out of context of the play. You know, you can put any story you want over it um, and, and it will work on its own w without the backdrop of the play around it. Mm. Um, but I'd say just be sensible about it. Find something that you can connect with as well. <clears throat> um, all of the ones that I've loved, kind of after reading them, I've almost immediately thought, I know how this would work. And then you know that kind of you know that that would be good for you. Yeah, you need like you need to want to perform it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah abs absolutely. I mean, there is there is no right or wrong answer. It's really whatever works for you as an individual. But mm -hmm. for me personally, I I try and look, I try and look for things that will stand on their own two feet, and um, something that that I have a really good feeling about, um, and make it active as well. Avoid lists because they're Avoid boring. <laughs> Oh, I, I can hear the training. Yeah, um, it's, it's bloody ingrained now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, moving on into training itself. Yeah. Um, did you have any... Because it's quite intimidating. Uh, we have all these mindsets, what we think it's going to be like. Um, and now with <laughs> new things like stage school, we probably have... Oh, God. ...whole new Stop expectations. Um, we could have a whole interview just on stage school. We well, I mean, it would be less of you and more of a rant from me, but... <laughs> Um, so I was wondering what expectations you had and how the reality uh, was different to that. So like, yeah, right. your expectations versus the reality of drama school. Okay. All right. Um, I didn't have many expectations, 
because I was still very new to acting. I started it so late. I had no idea. All I, I was like a, hmm. I was like a kid in a candy shop, right? I have no hmm. idea what I want. I just know that I want to go into this candy shop. If that, if that, that's a horrible analogy, but, but <laughs> I, I didn't know enough about it. I just, I knew that I wanted to be trained as an actor. So I was excited to, to start and see what the hell was going to happen. Mm. Um, the reality of what did happen was not too dissimilar from what I've heard, but it was, hmm. yeah, it is intimidating. It is, especially when you have a teacher like Vesner, who's the, the, the head of acting on, on the course at Central. Um, she's, she's a character. She's kind of, <laughs> I, honestly, I think she scared the shit out of most people kind of from day one. I, I remember the first kind of, she sent us this exercise. It was called The Room. I don't know if you ever did it, but it, you um, have to walk into this space and <laughs> uh, you, you have to essentially recreate a memory. Um, which has to revolve around a specific room in, in, in your house. And um, you, you, you have to kind of map out the, the, the walls, the door handle. You know, if you're remembering, and, and you have to like verbalize everything that you're doing to the whole class. So if you're opening a door, for example, you actually have to reach out into nothing, open the door, and you know, kind of a lot of stuff like that. Um, but before we even got to that class, I just remember the kind of mass panic which spread among the class of wanting to get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, was, that was very evident from day one. Everybody was scared to get things wrong. Mm -hmm. And that kind of mentality kind of created stress very early on. And it's something that lasted for quite a while. Because mm -hmm. the whole first year of training, it, it is essentially very much the kind of breaking somebody down mm -hmm. so that they... Rem but I mean... I don't really like it when people use that term because it, it's, it has a lot of very negative connotations. And I understand the, the, the method behind it. It's, you know, you, you go into drama school and you have a lot of bad habits and you need to get rid of them so that you can build yourself up to be more open to everything, I suppose. And so kind of every acting class, we would get very nervous to go in the room because we had no idea what she was going to do. And she's, you know, she's, she's from Serbia. She's got this Eastern European discipline, which none of us are used to, you know? So she, she wanted something done a very certain way. And we were scared shitless to get that wrong. Mm. And um, that was a hard thing to let go, I think. It took a year of that, a year of kind of... I, I like to think of first year as kind of really becoming your own person or starting to because me personally i can only explain things from from how i experienced it i spent the entire first year of my training trying to appease her and trying to do things for her which was totally the wrong way to go about it you know you have it, it, it took me a year and even a, a little bit into second year almost um after the two-week intensive that you start <laughs> with which is famous for being um okay so so um the navy seals Right, when they're in training, they go through something <laughs> called Hell Week, which is essentially just a week of, of uh, mental and physical torture. That's what I like to describe the um, the two week intensive at the beginning of second year, because it's just your class with Vesna in a really cold, bloody church down the road from Central. Working on material that none of you particularly enjoy very much. <laughs> and it's two weeks of blood, sweat and tears. <laughs> and when I came out of that, I kind of real. I, I said to myself, like, I don't want to do this for her anymore. I want to do this for me. Because that's why I'm here. I'm here mm -hmm. to become a better actor. I'm here to learn more about this craft. I don't... I mean, for the first couple of years, her opinion really mattered to everyone. It really, honest to God, did. And looking back on it, that is the most infectious and toxic mindset to have when you're training. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm being quite harsh because I mean, my, my experiences were quite bad, but I'm glad that I went through them because of where I'm at now. I, you know, now I, everything that I do is, is not to please other people, but it's for myself. It's because I enjoy what I do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's the same to be said about all acting teachers. They're not the be-all and end-all. 
You know, at the end of the day, they're just human beings and you should never be doing anything to satisfy them because you're only going to hinder yourself. You do, they're there to help and guide you, mm. right? And if for whatever reason they're, they're not doing that, it doesn't matter. You're doing it for yourself. And I think that's, that's the most important thing that, that you need to realize going into it. When you start out in drama school, you're going to automatically, because everyone does it, put so much trust and faith into your teachers. And so you should, right? Because they're there to help you. They're there to guide you. But the most important lesson that it, it's, really, it's going to be so helpful to learn from early on is do it for you and not for anyone else. Take all the help that you can get. Be a sponge. Soak up as much knowledge as you can. But at the end of the day, you're doing this for you. So, um, we all know that drama school, it results in spending three years with the same people um, who are your peers and also your best friends. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating, unique relationship that you probably won't experience in many other places um, because it's such a tight, small, enclosed space with the same people. Mm-hmm. So how do you deal with contention or personal relationships versus a professional relationship um, that you, where you have to work with your colleagues, but at the same time, they are your best friends or you may even have a relationship with one of them, anything like that. How do you, how do you cope with that? How do you deal with that? How do you, what is that experience? Mm. It, can be the, it can be the best thing in the world and it can also be the worst. I think um, you love working with your best friends um, you have an endless amount of fun and because you're best friends you feel so comfortable with each other um, and, and free and open that you can you can do some really awesome work I find um, what the thing is is <clears throat> being around the same group of people for three years especially during drama school training because a lot of it is not fun mentally right it's, it's it can be really really stressful um being around the same group of people you can get agitated and annoyed with each other very quickly they will say or do things which will just get on your nerves sometimes you will have a different way of working and when their way of working doesn't quite agree with yours or they do something which you don't agree with something very small can escalate very quickly. Um, it can be anything. Like, for example, if somebody is trying to do a warm-up, which doesn't work for you, and you know you don't... Uh, they, they kind of try and impose that way of working upon the class, but it's, you know, it, it, it works for some people, it doesn't work. It can be anything, anything like that. Then small problems can escalate very quickly, and, and it, it can be difficult. I think it takes a lot of... Um, professionalism and maturity to if you are arguing with one of your one of your classmates just you need to remember to leave that at the door when when you're rehearsing because at the end of the day we're all here for the same reason we want to get we want to become better actors and if you drag that into the rehearsal room uh, it becomes very evident very quickly and it is tough um, if you're argue, if you if you don't get on with somebody in the class and everybody has people they don't get on with and you have to work with that person, then it can be really annoying. You know, even subconsciously, because you don't like that person, it, it, it will affect your work. And you'll be, you'll be distracted, you won't be able to kind of, you know, you'll close yourself off, you won't be able to explore many different ways of working. And it's, it's in terms of coping with it, that's an ongoing struggle for everyone, I think. You can say, you can say to yourself, and I think most people do, all right, I've had an argument with this person, but I'm just going to forget about that and, and, and go and work. Because you might, you know, that might not be a sentiment that, that the other person in question shares, if you get what I mean. So, if, you know, you could be rehearsing a scene and you're really, you know, you're trying to focus, but the other person is still really annoyed with you. So that's coming through, or it could be the other way around. You just can't let it go. And it's, it's tough. There is no... There is no right way to, to cope with it. You can only hope that everybody's going to hold the same standard of professionalism as each other. Um, but, and yeah, it's, it's very easy to get annoyed with people because you fight like, 
like you fight with your family, you know? And because you're around each other all the time, you get to a certain level of comfort with those people that you don't have a filter. In terms of the fact that like somebody can say something which you don't agree with or annoys you and you'll immediately call them out on it. Because you can, because you're so close to that person, right? And I think, so that's great in terms of it's a very open and honest environment, but at the same time, it it can it can very easily blow up into a into a full blown argument or situation. So I think it's it's an ongoing battle. There is no right and wrong way. Just try and be as professional as you can, um, and and hope that the others do the same. But like I said, I mean, it, you know, I I have some amazingly close friends on this course, people who I'm gonna know for the rest of my life and I adore working with them. They're my favorite people to work with in the world because we can just do anything and just have an absolute laugh. Um, and like, it was like you were saying earlier actually, um, before we started this kind of, we can be really professional in a rehearsal room but still do enough taking the piss that we can have a laugh with it. Mm. And, and I think that close relationship that you have with those people um, it just it, it just it opens things up in terms of like acting and like the fun and enjoyment that you can get from from rehearsing. So it's I mean being with those people all day every day, like anything, it has its ups and it has its downs. Mm. Cool, awesome. Thank you very much. Oh, that's the answer. Yeah. So over the first two years, what was the weirdest lesson? Just a lesson that you, you look back and you, what? Like you just, was just bizarre. Like almost fills those, um, those hilarious caricature drama school stories and anecdotes. I've got such a bad one. Oh, um. <laughs> it was um, during one of Vesna's classes, surprise, surprise. <clears throat> um, how do I explain this? Picture this, okay? Um, you have 18 people in your mandatory drama school blacks um, crawling along the floor pretending to be animals um, rolling all over each other and interweaving your body parts with theirs um, and, and then in the corner you just have two other people in the class who are pretty much full on just fucking as their animals <laughs> that's that's right up there. <laughs> that that's right up there with one of them. I think that that's the one which springs to mind first. Um, rolling around with each other, pretending to be animals, sniffing, and making animal noises. Um, there's just, I mean, you know, drum. When you're in that class, you really want to get the most out of it. So you do focus and you do try and do it to the best of your ability. But I'll be damned if anyone has never gone through one of those classes, just having that one moment where, where you realise what you're doing and you think, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> and it, oh, I have to, yeah. It happens to everyone. I um, definitely, at times, I've walked past rehearsal spaces, because um, you know the way Central works, where you've got the huge movement space and then you've got that kind of almost observatory yeah. kind of <laughs> window. Yeah, where you, where you, you can... feel like you're in a zoo. <laughs> My favourite thing is when the, the, the tourists come round and I, <laughs> I remember we were in a dance class and, and uh, it, was, it was a fully Japanese uh, tour that just, just came round and literally, camera's out, taking pictures <laughs> of us. Uh, sorry, no, go on, go on. What um, yeah, because those, those, those movement classes where you're just kind of being water and you're moving around the space. Yeah. And you Pink feel... Pink mist. Yeah. <laughs> and you feel so connected at the time. And then if you watch one... God, they just and, and you see it and you're, you're going. I have I have done that. Mm -hmm. it, it that is that is awful. Yep. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's they are hilarious, but the, at the time, thankfully, you get rid of all of those classes kind of early on in your first year. <laughs> yeah. um, well, that hey, I mean, I've gone back to uh, uh, being a being a forest fire for a couple of character yeah. preparations. <laughs> it hasn't worked, but I tried it. <laughs> Uh, you're about to go into third year. Um, you've had two years of actual training so far. What are you most excited or terrified 
um, about uh, Infer Deer, and then therefore after that, going into the big wide world, what is m either most exciting or most intimidating, and or both, and why? Um, most exciting, I think, is performing those shows in front of a public audience because we haven't really had that. The only time we had that was with uh, Sweet Charity uh, last year, but our year with the ensemble. Um, I, th I think now that we're doing our own shows and it's and, and especially for the Crucible, which we're doing next time, it's it's just us. Um, we're going to be performing this in front of not only our friends and our family and general and anyone else who fancies coming along on a Friday night, but also we've got industry coming in, and that that's kind of a big deal, you know, because. We want to get noticed. We want to get signed. We we all want to graduate with a great agent and start working and um, get paid fourteen point one million for our next Hollywood blockbuster. Um, I'd say, I think in terms of excitement, it's just the whole journey of it because now we don't have any classes. We've just got shows. We just have rehearsal processes, and we get to work. You know, with uh, we get to work with more great outside directors and chore and choreographers and stuff like that. Um, I think just the journey is the most exciting um, thing. The, the most terrifying um, is casting, I would say. Um, and personally, I think just getting getting either to third term or or graduating, you know, without without much interest. Mm. I think I think that's that's scary. Also, another thing is kind of we have had two years of training, so there's. A certain amount of pressure on us from friends, family, teachers, that we should, you know, be ready by now. It's a terrible way to put it because you know you're ne you're never ready. Acting is always a development, um, right the way through life. But it's it's our third year show. You know, it's our mm. final year shows. There's a there's a certain standard, I suppose, mm. as a way to put it, that that we're expected to meet. And I think one thing that I honestly particularly fear is um, not meeting that standard mm -hmm. in whatever I'm cast as. Um, yeah, so either, either that or, or the obvious unemployment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm less worried about that because there are loads of actors who are unemployed and they seem to be really happy, so... Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, fine. Or at least they're <laughs> acting happy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, okay, so you said uh, earlier that you had a fear of casting. Um, now, now that is a, I mean, that's of course, a very uh, frequent, very common fear you'll have or anything, but could you expand on that feeling? Um, anyway? Yeah, um, this actually relates back to the previous question um, of, of being around the same people who are close for three years. Um, everybody wants a chance to shine in, in, in drama, or just in, in this industry, right? Every, we all love it. We all love getting cast in those fantastic roles where we get to stretch ourselves um, and show off, essentially. And I, th and I think, um, especially with, with, with my class, kind of, and I can say this because it's not, it's not insulting, it's just, it's just honest. There, you know, whenever, there's always been a lot of tension when uh, something's about to be cast because it is competitive. It is, especially... Um, in a class in drama school, because there's only certain amount of people within that class who are going to get the you know the the prolific roles, mm. and whenever something's about to be cast, it is tense. When the casting comes out, nobody's ever happy, and that causes kind of a rift which you have to deal with. And some people are better at handling that situation than others, but others are just terrible at it, and you kind of you have to suffer there wrath a bit well you know if they don't get the casting that, that they desired but um it it is it is scary especially after you've auditioned for it you know if you're if you're just being cast based off of what a director's seen from you in a workshop then it's a little bit different but if you've auditioned for it um then it can get really nerve-wracking because you start all those insecurities and doubts start to creep in. Did I do a good enough job? You know, okay, I didn't get that role. Why? What didn't they like about me? What didn't I do enough? Um, of course, that's not always 
those aren't answerable questions and maybe there's no need to even answer those questions but it's it's scary mm -hmm. it is um but at the, at the same time like in terms of what it feels like um it can feel fantastic if you if you get what you've worked for that's the best feeling if you've worked really hard for something and you get it there, there's kind of no greater reward in my mind mm. um so there's pros and cons with it Ma mainly cons because be because you're because you're, no, I'll be honest because yeah, yeah. because you're in a class with people that you know so well you worry for the other people mm. and and you share everything with these people so if somebody else is unhappy or I'm unhappy you share it with that person whether you know that you do or not mm. um, so it it usually takes a while for all that to die down a bit but yeah cast casting is just one of those things within the industry which is always going to be a bit tense mm. but um, temporary. So going back to first year and second year, uh, looking back on it in hindsight, if you could change one thing about the way you approached your work in those two years, what would it be? Um, any regret in any form? Yeah, I took it and myself too seriously. I was, uh, uh, I was too stressed, I was too wound up. I didn't take enough time to just sit back, relax and go at my own pace. Because it's, there is no end destination with acting. It's always in development. And if you're ready for something, you're ready. If you're not, don't stress. You know, wait a bit and, and keep keep working at it. But I, the biggest mistake that I made was just taking myself too seriously with it. Because that only hindered me. Mm. Because I wasn't able to, you know, with relaxation comes like focus and uh, being open. And those are two very important things that, that you need for, for acting. And I just got, I got too stressed with it, which just, it, I, I, would, I would often be more unhappy than I was happy with, with work or like um, rehearsing something. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say don't take it too seriously. Mm. Awesome. If you could leave a message <coughs> for a 30 year old Oscar um, that you want to kind of, you hope, that this Oscar will feel a certain way or anything, if you could leave a message for yourself, what would it be? What would you say? I hope the beach outside your window isn't too cold. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, if I could leave a message to my 30-year-old self, um, I'd probably say, I hope you're still going at it. I hope you're happy. Um, yeah. No, no, it's a, it's a good question. I think I just, it's something I never really considered. I think in, off the top of my head, I, I would just, yeah, I, I'd say I hope you're still working at it. I hope you're happy and um, I hope you're still working hard and, and that it's paying off. Mm. Um, I, think, I think kind of hard work and happiness are, are two very important things that there's no point in, in, in doing anything else. You know, there's no point in doing something if you're not going to be happy while, while, you're, while you're doing it. So I would hope that in 30 years time, or when I'm 30 rather, that um, I'm, just, I'm still loving it and I'm still finding new things about it, which, which I love. Yeah. Okay. I think secretly every actor, the main reason they perform is an excuse to dress up um, in the wackiest, most extravagant costumes. God, um, yes. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I played Edna in Hairspray. <laughs> I don't think my feet have recovered from dancing in heels. <laughs> I'll say that. But no, it was it was full out. It was like the fat suit, the ridiculously disgusting, uh, multicolored floral dress, mm. ridiculous like red wig which is about a meter tall, um, and pink fluffy slippers but with a heel on them. Um, and I had an abundance of costume changes, uh, not excluding a, a sparkly uh, red frilly dress. Oh, that's amazing. I don't no, think I've no ever, it's not. I don't think I've ever had anything uh, that spectacular. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have some quick fire questions now. Um, oh, God. So answer this as best you can. There's a bit of fun that we do for every yeah. person. So, cats or dogs? Dogs. Favourite comfort food? Ice cream. Ideal holiday location. Turkey. Uh, favorite word. Cunt. Ooh, least favorite word. 
flabbergasted. Oh. Uh, least favourite food? Fish. Uh, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars! Lord of the Rings or Game of Thrones? Mm. <laughs> That's such a dick question, you know it. <laughs> um, Lord of the Rings. Uh, favourite swear word? Cunt. <laughs> favourite super... Oh, sorry, what superpower would you have? Oh, fly. Fly. Awesome. I think we had that twice now, I think. Uh, we might have had it more. Um, but uh, people's favourite word is also their favourite swear word. Yeah. Um, so. so satisfying to say. A lot of people are really, get, are really against it because it is one of the worst swear words. But, but I'm, and I also think it's a very British thing. Mm. Br- especially British people, they love that swear word. Yeah, it's um, fab. It's very satisfying, yeah. Okay, so uh, the final question of the interview. Oh. Um, it's the title of the show. We're here already. We're here already. So... What next? Well, uh, in a couple of days we have auditions for The Crucible, which is our first uh, public production at Central. And um, yeah, that, that I'm kind of in preparation for that. I've chosen my monologue, uh, might need to do a bit more work on it. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Crucible, the Crucible is next for me. That's, that's my main focus at the moment. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so uh, much. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you for everyone who tuned in. Uh, don't forget to follow, like, subscribe, all that all that stuff if you find yourself on those sites. If you're looking at that page and you're an um, agent or, or casting director, then hire me. Yeah, uh, you heard it here. Uh, mm-hmm. A rising star. Oscar no, Dahl. seriously, please. Please, <laughs> please, please. It's, it's hard. In, in just do it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so thank you very much, man. Um, and join us next week for a really special guest. Au revoir. (laughs) Thanks for tuning in to this episode of So What Next? If you like the sound of Oscar, his links will be in the description below along with a playlist just in case you missed an episode. Next week we'll be taking a look backstage, so don't forget to tune in. And as always, don't forget to like, favorite, subscribe, and check us out on Facebook and Twitter for all the latest. Remember to leave us a comment on your way out, and thanks once again for tuning in to this episode of So, What's Next? <laughs>